All right, everyone. Hello from your very favorite absentee political science professor. Um, when we left off two weeks ago, we were discussing what sorts of factors might lead individuals to decide to, to join uh, rebel groups or state forces that are opposing rebel groups. And Harvey's and <laughs> Harvey's Humphreys and Weinstein had left us with three potential groups of explanations. First are expressive or grievance explanations in which exclusion from economic or political or social life causes someone to be interested in fighting to change the status quo and allow themselves to participate. Second, a set of theories that argue that recruitment is the result of selective incentives. These are direct payments or threats that are given to a potential recruit to attempt to change the way they view the cost-benefit structure of joining an organization. And then lastly, social network explanations that argue that recruits respond to community pressures or to their perceptions of who their friends and family members are likely to value them serving in a civil war. So I'd asked you at the end of the last class to take some time and imagine some hypotheses that you might actually test from these different theories, right? How are we going to compare each of these groups, these sorts of things. Okay, so let's take a look at slightly more granular versions of the hypotheses that Humphreys and Weinstein in fact use. With respect to expressive or grievance explanations, we hypothesize that people who are economically deprived, our first hypothesis, are people that are economically deprived are more likely to join a rebel group, probably less likely to join the state group. You're, you're more likely to join the state group if you're richer because you're defending the status quo. Two, they might, join, they might join rebel groups if they feel politically marginalized. That is, the political agenda or the policies that they prefer are not on the table. Um, and therefore, they feel that the only way that they can achieve this political change is by fighting. And then lastly, that they feel alienated from mainstream political processes. That is, the entire system isn't working for them. It's not that um, you know, they disapprove of the policy that the government is putting in place. It's that they think that something about the, the larger system is broken. And we'll take a look at how each of these concepts are operationalized, what it is that Humphreys and Weinstein actually measure in just a few minutes. And we can, we can evaluate whether we think that these are good ways to measure expressive or grievance explanations. With respect to selective incentives, relatively straightforward. Um, those people who receive bribes to fight are more likely to fight for the side that offered them the bribe, and those who feel that they would be safer inside a fighting faction than outside of it. Notice that the way this hypothesis is phrased suggests that the selective incentive might not be generated by the rebel group or by the state. Um, it might not be generated by issuing a direct threat. It might exist plainly because the recruit at issue feels unsafe wherever they live and think that having the protection of some sort of a faction, whether it's state or a rebel group, will make them safer. And lastly, for social networking explanations, two potential hypotheses that Humphreys and Weinstein derive from this. People will join the organization um, that the rest of their community is involved in. They're not going to buck the trend of a rebel sympathetic village to join the state or vice versa. So we would want some sort of measure of how supportive the community is to a particular group. And that should be correlated with the, the group that our subjects in the survey actually join. And then second, we should expect to see that this relationship is stronger where the community is strong, where the community has strong social structures. Let's take a look really quickly at how we operationalize these two particular hypotheses. These are, these are interesting and complicated. First, with respect to hypothesis six, to create a measure of social ties, rather than attempting to measure who the community actually supports, Humphreys and Weinstein ask each of their respondents, or each of their respondents who said that they were encountered or uh, approached by an armed group, how they first encountered the group. They make the argument that where social ties are driving this connection, the introduction should be made by a friend or family member. If the community is very supportive of the rebel group, and that's the ultimate reason that a particular recruit joins, it's likely that they were introduced, or disproportionately likely that, disproportionately likely that they were introduced to the rebel group by a friend or family member, someone whose opinion they care about. 
Um, so if we see that these encounters are instead some sort of mass social meeting or recruitment drive by the rebel groups, then the rebel groups aren't relying on these local networks. And it's unlikely that what's happening is um, that there's some sort of community pressure that is forcing the recruits to join or, or persuading the recruits to join one side or the other. With respect to strong social ties, again, Humphreys and Weinstein explicitly admit that they lack a way to measure this directly and instead focus on the relative geographical isolation of the village. Is the village accessible only by foot or boat? Now, why might it be that they would operationalize the concept of strong social structures by focusing on geographic isolation? Hopefully, your memory of Peterson and Michael Taylor is tickled just a little bit right now, right? Their definitions of strong communities both involved relatively small communities with multilateral relationships, right? Places where your religious and political and social and economic lives are intertwined because that gives people more leverage to punish defection than if all of our um, all of our relationships are single-sided. So Humphreys and Weinstein are making an assumption here. It's an assumption that's backed by some amount of evidence, but an assumption that villages that are accessible only by foot or by vote, by boat are likelier to have these sorts of multilateral relationships and disproportionately likely to be smaller communities and therefore have the strong social structures characterized by Peterson and Taylor. Okay, quick run through the evidence. First, we start with a table that just lays out the percentage of each side's recruits that lists each reason um, for joining as a reason that they joined. A few things that you might know. Just take a look at this. Um, take a look at this chart. Where do you see the highest numbers? I think there are a few things that are interesting to note. First, see that the political goals seem to persuade lots of people to join the CDF, the Civilian Defense Forces, the militias that were organized in order to defend the state, but that relatively few people who joined the RUF did so because they supported the group's political goals. That's interesting, right? Very few people seem to be persuaded by the RUF's political goals, but lots of people seem to be persuaded to fight in order to maintain the status quo. Um, second, obviously, is that the RUF appears to have kidnapped quite a few people, while the CDF did not. And then lastly, in those green circles down there, it's interesting to note that a plurality of both rebel groups or both rebel recruits mentioned that they were frightened for their own security and thought that they might be more secure fighting in the rebel group than they were outside of it. Slightly more in the CDF felt this way than did in the RUF. Okay. Next, we'll move on to the regression results with respect to determinants of participation in rebellion. We're going to see two models here, one for participation in rebellion, one for participation in the state. Humphreys and Weinstein argued at the top of the paper that the reasoning for joining each of these groups might be different. And in fact, uh, this last slide suggests that we should expect that in our regression results. So which major variables jump out at you as being relevant in each of the models that they provide? Remember, you're looking for the stars here that are next to um, the effect and the standard error of each, of each variable. So one thing that jumps out right away, mud walls, having mud walls on your home is statistically significantly correlated with later joining a rebel group. Why mud walls? Well, in the context of Sierra Leone, having mud walls on your house suggests that you are relatively poor. People who are richer in Sierra Leone either have concrete or wooden walls, and it's the poor who have mud walls. So we have operationalized grievance in this case to mean people that are relatively poor in material terms. Um, why might that be a problem? Can you think of any reason that you might criticize this operationalization of grievance? Notice, offered money to join is the way that we eventually operationalize our selective incentives reasoning. Um, you might imagine that people who are relatively poor are also going to be disproportionately prone to respond to selective monetary incentives. So because we can see right off the bat that the selective monetary incentives are statistically significantly correlated with joining the RUF, we might actually conclude that the mud walls are not about grievance, but about greed.
That being said, we also note that lack of access to primary education or, or education beyond primary education is also significantly correlated with joining the rebel group. Now again, this lack of opportunity that might be created by not attending primary school or by only finishing primary school rather than going on to secondary school or even college suggests that people are shut out of economic opportunities and they might believe the only way to ameliorate that problem is to fight. It's also probably true that people who are more poorly educated are poorer and again more likely to respond to the selective incentive box below. Here, hypothesis two, marginalization from political processes. Um, we operationalize this by measuring whether or not the person supports a political party in Sierra Leone called the SLPP. You may recall from the first half of the lecture that Sierra Leone was a single party state at this point in time and the SLPP um, was that party. So if you don't support the SLPP, you don't really have a voice in government and therefore you might suspect that your uh, support for the SLPP is negatively correlated with the likelihood that you would join a rebel group. Um, and in fact, that's that's what we see, but the magnitude or the statistical significance isn't there. So what we, what we see here is, in fact, um, the political grievance doesn't seem to matter very much to people who joined the rebel groups. And that maybe shouldn't be surprising given the table that we saw a few slides ago, right? 70% of CDF fighters report that they joined because of the group's political goals, while less than 10% of RUF recruits say the same thing. Additionally, the RUF claimed to represent disenfranchised members of rural villages. But here we see that mobilization and recruitment were financed by chiefs who controlled access to land. So in fact, the defense, um, the RUF uh, was recruited by the local upper class. Returning to the results, we see that selective incentives appear to be important in most models. Basically, everyone talked about being offered money, even the people who were abducted. So the people who were abducted also said that they felt safer inside the group, and they also said that they were offered money to join. Why might that be? Why might a rebel group offer money and security to an abductee? Think about that as we move forward. Um, one potential reason, right, is that you're using carrots and sticks simultaneously. You threaten people, you abduct them, you offer them money, uh, and you hope that they join your group. But we'll see later that there's a potential, um, a potentially more local and social explanation for why abductees might get offered money as well. Uh, then lastly, the RUF appears to recruit their friends. This should be interesting too, right? In two of the four models, uh, being a friend suggests that you are likely to be recruited and that should strike you as being potentially a little bit strange but it fits with the social story that we're going to tell later. Notice that being um, a member of an isolated village does not seem to matter one way or the other. Okay, so here's what I've been talking about, the potential that there might be a link between kidnapping and social structure. It appears that in some cases parents and village elders sanctioned the um, sanction, sorry, that's the exact opposite of the word that I was looking for. Um, they approved of the kidnapping of youth from the village in order to fight for the RUF, where the village was broadly supportive of the RUF. They um, invited the RUF to come and kidnap people. This might suggest to you that many of the abductions that generated soldiers for the RUF were actually not abductions. Um, it was an attempt to give plausible deniability to recruits to a rebel group if they were captured to say that they were abducted and forced to fight, this might give them the opportunity to claim then um, an amnesty with the government. And so the abduction was really just a show. These were people who were interested in joining the RUF um, and interested in uh, fighting, but were abducted technically so that they would have an excuse. Okay, so some reflection questions here. Why do people fight in insurgencies? You might want to have an answer to that question for, say, an exam. And then second, how do you interpret the difference between the RUF and CDF recruitment models? And can we use these lessons to learn about, um, about other conflicts? Is this about grievance or is this about selective incentives? A final reflection question for you, right? 
it appears that people who had grievances were more likely to fight, but it also appears that people who were bribed were more likely to fight. Does this suggest to you that the rebel groups thought that paying people who had a grievance was a good way to lock them into their rebel group? Or does it suggest to you that people who might have a grievance or a reason for a grievance are ultimately pliable to selective incentives? Okay, moving on to Ellie Berman's Radical, Religious, and Violent. These are Hindu extremists at a rally threatening Christians in India. Here we have um, a different puzzle and a different question where Humphreys and Weinstein were concerned with why people join rebel groups. Berman is interested in why some rebel groups and some terrorist organizations succeed where others fail. So let's take a quick look at the puzzle here. What are the puzzles? There's an empirical puzzle, a straightforward contextual puzzle about the Taliban. How did this group of flunkies come to rule Afghanistan? If you read Berman's description of the Taliban, it should strike you that they were extremely uneducated, extremely poor soldiers, extremely poorly equipped. So how on earth um, did they move from essentially being this um, group of militia flunkies uh, that built upon an initial success in opening and guarding trade routes into a sophisticated military force, right? There's quite the transition that happens between early stage Taliban action and late stage Taliban action. We also have a theoretical puzzle, a theoretical puzzle that Berman derives from his, um, from his example of the, of the trade route. First, actually, let's go back to this to this question of the trade route, right? So at some point in time, there was a road that ran from um, across Central Asia and through Afghanistan that was important for trade. The government found it very difficult to keep that road open. There were so many clan militias and religious um, organizations that were fighting in the area that it essentially shut down trade through Afghanistan. And the way that the Taliban made most of their money was to open this trade route and, and guard it and keep it open. Berman argues that there's something of a puzzle to how this happened. The trade route is extremely long and isolated, and the trucks that went through the Taliban's checkpoints often carried goods that were worth many, many hundreds of times more money uh, than any single Taliban recruit was going to make in their entire life. So there's some temptation here for the Taliban recruits that are working in you know, isolated parts of this, um, of this road network to just steal the trucks and leave or to take all of the tax money that they pull from the drivers for a week and run with it instead of taking it back to the Taliban. But for some reason, where other rebel groups um, succumbed to this temptation, where the where the roadblock, the manners of the roadblock stole this money or stole these trucks, the Taliban never did. And Berman argues that solving this theoretical puzzle is a big part of the reason that the Taliban was able to mature as a military organization. Okay, so the need for secrecy and loyalty. Here is a quote from an interview with Sam Popkin, who is a professor emeritus at UCSD. I should say that Ellie Berman is also in the econ department at UCSD. Sam Popkin spent a lot of time wandering around Vietnam during the war years, interviewing members of the Viet Cong to discuss their rebel operations with them. And this particular conversation stands out to Berman. Popkin asks, if one of your members was killed, how long did it take for the organization to recover? And the rebel responded, a few days. And if a member defected? A week and two months. And why might it be that a defection hurts the rebel group more than a fatality? All right, somewhat obviously, when you think about it, the reasoning is that the defection gives up quite a few of the secrets, the operational secrets of the organization. So you have to change where your safe houses are. You have to change where your ammo drop points are. You have to change how you're deployed to defeat the enemy. Um, dead men tell no lies, they also tell no truths. So if you lose an important member of your organization, you replace them with the next person on the org chart. But if that person defects, you have to replace your entire tactical outlook. So here is the problem um, that I talked about just a few minutes ago in Berman's own words. What's to stop some Taliban members at a checkpoint from climbing into the cab and making off with the contents? The goods in that convoy is probably are worth more than the members of earn an entire lifetime. Notice that it's not just the direct problem 
If you put yourself in the shoes of a Taliban recruit manning a checkpoint, the problem isn't just that you're tempted to steal because it would make you richer. It's also that you know that every other recruit at every other checkpoint along this entire highway faces the same temptation. And if any of them begin to make off with the trucks, the Taliban loses. They don't raise any money. They don't become a sophisticated fighting force. And you missed your opportunity to enrich yourself. So this temptation is um, substantially exacerbated by the chance that someone else in your supply chain or your organization or your network is going to screw you over too. There's a free rider problem here. We'll talk about that next week when I return when we get to our, our mini game theory week. So how do insurgents decide when to defect? How do they know when to defect, right? Um, they fail, right? They know to defect when their organization is going to fail. Targeting civilian Palestinians was too destructive for a constituency of the Jewish underground, a secular Jewish terrorist organization. Um, their constituency didn't support it, which set the stage for an informant to defect, right? The informant knows that the community thinks that murdering innocent Palestinians is wrong, and so the informant might leave the Jewish underground and defect. So this problem of defection is really, really real. The need for secrecy and loyalty presents a lot of organizational problems for rebel groups, right? So the individual's personality here, and Qassam's telling, Qassam was a recruiter for Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Um, you need trustworthy people. But how does this happen? How do you get trustworthy people? How do you know that a person representing themselves as trustworthy isn't just doing so so they can screw you over and steal a truck from the convoy? Okay. A second theoretical puzzle that obsesses Berman is why anyone would join a group that demands them to sacrifice. Here, notice, he's not just talking about violent organizations like the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or the Jewish underground. In fact, he's talking about organizations like the Amish. In order to be a member of an Amish or Quaker society, you have to give up quite a bit. Access to lots of modern technology. Um, you're not allowed to treat with the outside world. It puts a cap on your income. The amount of time that you spend engaged in religious and community obligations frustrates your ability to follow your own muse and have your own hobbies and do the things that interest you. So Berman argues that people who join these sorts of religious organizations, and it is particularly religious organizations that require these sorts of social sacrifices, do so because they get mutual aid. In the picture here, the Amish are doing something that they're famous for, right? They're having a barn raising. It takes a long, long time or a lot, a lot of money to build a barn for yourself. But if your community comes together with you, you can build a barn relatively quickly. Berman argues that religious societies that engage in mutual aid are providing a massive economic uh, benefit to their membership. So why does mutual aid present yet another puzzle, right? Think about the problem that the Taliban face. Isn't it similar to the problem that the Amish face? You're an Amish person. You join an Amish community. You need a barn built. The community comes over and builds your barn. Now it's time next weekend to build someone else's barn. What's the temptation? Well, your barn is built, so maybe you should sit this one out, right? And if everyone who's building your barn knows that's what you're likely to do, then no one comes and builds your barn. Classic collective action problem. Um, similar here in this uh, Islamic lending society, why don't you defect after you receive your loan? Don't pay the loan back. Don't ever go to the lending society meetings again. Don't provide your money into the lending group anymore. How do we prevent people from shirking on these duties? Right? Religious societies that provide mutual aid create an incentive to abuse them to abuse them, right? You create an incentive for people to join your group, take the mutual aid, and then leave. So how do you prevent shirking on these duties? Well, maybe you impose some crazy requirements on group members. Yeah, we'll eventually raise your barn. Um, you may even be the first one whose barn gets raised. But in the off-season, you're not allowed to drink. And certainly not with anyone who's outside of our group. You can't travel by car. You can't go to a coffee shop. You're not allowed to watch movies or use the internet, right? You have to dress unusually. You speak a weird language. Um, 
and you have a lot of rules about who you're allowed to have sex with. So why does imposing these crazy requirements on members prevent shirking? First, you're selecting on character. You're only finding people who are willing to engage in great sacrifice to help the group survive until they get the aid. This, if, if people are willing to put up with these rules before they get the aid, then they're comparatively unlikely to leave once they've gotten it. You know that you've selected someone with the right kind of character. Second, you create codependent communities. The people that you screw over for aid have multiple connections to you. If you're, for example, a member of an Amish community, no one is going to speak that language outside of your community. You don't know how to use an iPhone or a program Python. You're less valuable to anyone outside of the community. So because you have adhered to these rules, it makes you doubly screwed if you leave after you receive your aid. The aid is no longer worth it. Um, which is also sort of the point here, dependency on the community. Members are less qualified or welcome in alternative groups. One of the reasons that the Amish come back from Rome Springa is that they don't fit in well in the outside world. They go out and they're allowed to use drugs and drink and they do so with each other, but most of them don't really have a great time. They realize that they've come to depend on the rules and social structures to which they're accustomed in the Amish community. And so most of the Amish come back from Rumspringa and give up alcohol and become stable members of a mutual aid society. Notice that there are many, many other signaling mechanisms that serve a similar purpose. Think about face tattoos for gang members. What does your grand say whenever someone with face tattoos comes into TGI Fridays? How are they ever going to find a job? Well, the point is that they're not. If you tattoo skinhead on your face, you're signaling to the group that you're not looking for a job outside of the social circle that you have now. You've made a credible sacrifice. And Berman argues that these sorts of credible sacrifices, these ways of making yourself more dependent on your community, less able to engage with the community around you, signal that you have the right kind of character to receive mutual aid, recruits a certain type of person. So in sum, the religious society is profitable to you once you're through to the other side. Once you've invested enough in following the weird rules, you get the mutual aid. And only people that can handle the upfront cost get the benefit of a strong community. Okay, so what does this have to do with the puzzle of violence and secrecy, right? I've focused on Islamic lending societies and the Amish for a particular reason. Neither of those groups are known to be particularly violent. So why would Berman focus on these groups in order to explain violence? Well, people in communities that fit this category, he argues, make better terrorists. Berman doesn't claim that these are the types of people that are more violent, but instead, if we track back through the three puzzles, we see that religious terrorists are more successful Secular terrorists are bad at being terrorists because they never put their membership through the ringers of an exclusive religious society. Lots of people tried to take over Afghanistan, but the Taliban succeeded because they were the first to transition the advantages of a radical, radical, deeply exclusive form of Islamic religiosity into advantages in organizational violence. They solved the collective action problem at the mutual aid stage, and then parlayed that organizational strength into producing violence. So, evidence of this particular proposition, right? Um, Lee Iacone produces this uh, club, uh, club goods model that we'll talk about more in our Game Theory Week. He creates a number of novel predictions about religious radicals, that lent themselves to testing, right? But Iacone couldn't test these things. We didn't have the, the data gathering capacity or um, we didn't have the data gathering capacity or the statistical methodology to test these things. And so Berman goes out to test these hypotheses for him. So we should see that radical religious communities, and again, radical religious communities here does not refer to communities that are violent, but rather, rather those that engage in radical social exclusion, should be tighter knit than other social groups. They should minimize outside contacts. They should have smaller congregations. And still, even though they're smaller, higher attendance at services. They should have less education, and they should earn less because they have less education, but still donating a greater proportion of their income to charity because they're more committed. So let's take a look at whether or not this evidence obtains, right? And let's also take a look at what this has to do with the puzzle of violence and secrecy, right? 1997 to 1998, India suffered a currency crisis. 
food prices soared, rural families increased their attendance at religious ceremonies, and they sent their children to madrasas more often than public schools for schooling. The increases in religious behavior did not occur among rice farmers. Okay, so let's, let's take a second to deconstruct this hypothesis a little bit here about what's happening. You have two groups of people. One grows the staple crop that is becoming scarce, and the other is forced to buy it. If religiosity is really a way of getting mutual aid for many people, what patterns would you expect to obtain in who becomes more religious when the food price shock hits? Well, of course it's not going to be the rice farmers, because they're making more money than they ever have before. They don't need the mutual aid of a religious society, but who does? The people who buy the food, right? So food consumers tended more often to send their children to religious schools and attend religious services. So this is something of a smoking gun. It's also true that extremists spend more time in church. Berman comes up with a way to describe whether a church is what he calls church-like or sect-like. Churches have um, sort of programmatic ways of running themselves, whereas sects are inward facing. Um, and we notice a couple of things here, right? Attendance at Sunday service and evening meetings goes way up for the sect-like churches. And you tend to have more church friends, right? So you're going to church more times a year and you have more church friends, the more sect-like your organization becomes. Membership size is also smaller. Churches... Churches that look like large communities that are relatively undemanding socially on their members have large congregations. Lots and lots of people come to church, whereas sects have many, many smaller, um, many, many, uh, much, much smaller congregations, right? Also notice that your membership in non-church organizations drops. If you're a Catholic or a Protestant, you're likely to belong to a number of clubs, or organizations that are non-religious. On an average, it appears 3.5. Whereas if you're a member of, say, an Amish group, fewer than two. So there's a large difference between how much you work outside of your, um, or socialize outside of your church. Sects have lower membership incomes, right? The average member of a church-like congregation in the United States makes about $65,000 a year, whereas the average member of a sect makes more like 45,000. Berman also provides evidence that this is correlated with the average education of the members of churches versus sects. But you'll notice that despite the fact that sect members make substantially less money, they donate more in both absolute and relative terms to charity, particularly the charities that are associated with their churches. Fertility is only rising among radical sects of religion in the, moderately or in the modern and developed world, right? Ultra-Orthodox ultra Jews have seen um, a jump in their fertility rates, whereas all other forms of Jews, Christians, and Muslims have seen an average decrease in their fertility rate over the same time period. There are groups of Christians that are substantially more f fertile than others, right? We have outliers here that match our predictions about whether sects and churches behave differently. These are the Hutterites. The Hutterites live primarily in North and South Dakota. They moved to uh, North and South Dakota from Germany in the mid-1800s. At the low point, at the time that they first arrived, there were only about 28 Hutterites. Now there are uh, something in the realm of 900. The current birth rate among Hutterite women is 9.9 .9 children per woman. That exceeds the highest average birth rates of Sub-Saharan Africa, where, the, where birth rates are still the highest overall. Okay, so how does Berman solve... Oh, I guess we can go over this reading. Never mind. Forget about this discussion question. Oh, attendance question. Um, it's really loud here in Kathmandu. I don't know if you've heard all the dogs barking and cars honking in the background. I found the quietest part of my apartment to try and record this lecture. So in honor of Kathmandu's noise, uh, tell me the noisiest place that you've ever traveled as your attendance question for this lecture. Okay, thank you very much, and I will see you all on video again uh, when we will discuss civil war, the conclusion of civil wars, how civil wars come to an end. Talk to you then.